Welcome to Dream City Omaha. My name is Melissa and I want to thank you for joining us today. If this is your first time or you would like to connect with us, please reach out to dreamcityomaha.church slash connect or send us a direct message on our Facebook or Instagram. Now sit tight as service will begin soon. Amen. Thank you, Melissa. A lot going on. There's a, there's a lot coming up in the, the next few weeks. Uh, if you didn't catch all of those announcements, you can find the rest of that, all of that, uh, again, on the app. And, and not just that, but what's coming up as well on the website, you can find that information also. This Wednesday, kind of just to, to recap for those of you that maybe were, were, were writing, filling out your, your, your check or, or you were giving online, um, just to, to recap, this Wednesday, we're having a night of worship. So that's going to be here in the sanctuary, Wednesday night, 7 p.m., uh, it's something that, that we started last year kind of at the end of every quarter, every, every discipleship quarter. Uh, on the week in between the, the end of one quarter and the start of another quarter, we come together, young, old, it doesn't matter. We're all together in one place, spending time in worship, praying for, for God's will to be done in our city, in our nation. I think right now, especially, is a time where we need to come together in prayer. Come on, somebody. And so just want to encourage you, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. here uh, in the sanctuary, um, want to encourage you for that. Also, uh, the following Wednesday, our in-person discipleship is starting. If those, those of you that are watching online will continue to stream online discipleship on Wednesdays. But uh, for those of you that, that are, are here in person, we will be having Unveiled in person starting the 16th. If you didn't hear about it uh, in the announcements, make sure that you sign up just so that we can make sure we have enough space for, for those of you that are going to be, be attending. And then finally, this one wasn't in the announcements, but uh, I do want to let you know, Deviate, which is our, our uh, middle school and high school ministry, uh, is starting up Wednesday the, the 16th as well in person. Um, before we before we kick off that way, though, we, we decided we're going to get together, have a kind of a, a fun hangout night this Friday. We're going to be outside playing playing games, we're doing an, an outdoor movie. That's going to be at my house. Uh, sa- I'm sorry, Saturday. I said Friday. It's actually Saturday. Uh, you can follow the, the Deviate Facebook page. You can get more information there. You can send the church a message. Give us a call. We'll let you know everything that you need to know. Uh, about that. But Saturday night for all of those in, uh, in middle school, high school, we're going to get together and have some fun. Sound good? Are you ready for the word today? Yes. This morning, we're going to continue our series entitled, He's Got This. Let me say, He's Got This. Aren't you thankful that you don't have to have this? Because I don't know about you, I definitely don't got this. <laughs> the season that that we're living in the season that we've we've walked through and and really even are walking into is a season that I've never experienced in my life that I've never I've never I've never had to to lead through a global pandemic I've never had to lead through the racial t- tension and the racial divide that we see in our country today at least in my generation for, for those my age and younger, this is a time that, that is unprecedented for us. I've never had to walk through this and, and to walk through everything that we've had to walk through just in the last five months and, and still have an election to go. That's like the cherry that's just on top of all of it. And it's like, thanks, God, I, I appreciate that. But I'm thankful that in it all and through it all, I don't have to have this. That the promise is that God's got this. And so we've looked the last few weeks at Psalm 46, and, and it says in Psalm 46 that God is my refuge, He is my strength, He is a very present help in time of need. The psalmist goes on to, to say that even though the mountains might fall into the sea, and even when the, when the seas ro- foam and, and roar, I will not fear. God, you are with me, and, and I, can, I can find shelter in you. I can find comfort in you. I can find strength in you. I can find everything that I need in you. I don't have to have it, and I don't have to find it in me. Yeah. I don't know about you, but that encourages me. I've been encouraged by that in this series. And, and God, help me to run to you as my refuge. God, help me to, to not hide my weakness, but embrace my weakness because it's, it's in embracing my weakness that your strength can be made perfect in and through my weakness. Last week, Pastor Angel talked to us about how God is a help in time of need. Today, I wanna to continue this series. We're gonna be in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter one, we're gonna begin reading in verse number three. 
We're going to read through verse 7. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And those of you that don't have your Bibles, the verses will be on the screens for you. But the Apostle Peter is writing, and he's writing to the church kind of scattered throughout Rome. He's writing to, to, to groups of believers in five Roman pro- provinces throughout Asia Minor. And here's what he says, verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Somebody say amen. amen. It is by his great mercy we've been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, so he kind of sets the scene. Like we have this, this promise of eternal life. We've got this great hope that we can look forward to. He continues, says, now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Let me read that again for those that maybe that just kind of went right over your head or maybe in one ear and out the other. Through your faith, God is protecting you. God is your defender by his power until you receive this salvation. What salvation? The salvation that one day we're we're gonna leave this place, we're gonna be with Jesus, we're gonna rule and we're gonna reign with him for eternity. It says, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. How many of you that makes you truly glad? How many of you, with everything that we've gone through over the last few months, you're like, yes, can that come today? Like, <laughs> like that, that hope and that inheritance and that salvation and, and being truly glad, like, yes, looking forward to that makes me really glad and I can't wait till I can walk in the promise of that. That's where the believers were at this point. Peter continues, says, there is wonderful joy ahead, even though, now here's kind of slides this in there. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Let's pray for our time together. Lord, I thank you for your word. God, I pray today that that it would be made active in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, may these not just be words that we hear, but but Lord, may this, this take root in our hearts, producing much fruit, producing eternal fruit, producing fruit that isn't choked away by the cares of the world or the, the hard times that we go through. But Lord, may we be that good soil today that would produce fruit in our lives. May we go and not be hearers, but help us to be doers of your word. God, we thank you that it's, it's living, that it's active, that it's useful for showing us the things we're doing right and correcting us when we're doing things wrong. Lord, today I pray for those that need encouragement, that they would find encouragement in your word. For those that need strength, that they would find strength in your word. For those that need to be challenged, God, I pray that you would challenge us through your word today. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. amen. This morning, I want, to, I want to talk to you about the truth about trials. The truth about trials, because there's things in our trials that oftentimes are hard to see. There's things that when we're going through hardship, when we're going through storms, when, 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 when life seems to be going crazy, when like the psalmist wrote, the mountains are crumbling into the sea and the seas are raging and foaming in our lives, there are things that are very easy for us to miss. As I thought about this, I thought of, of a stereogram. How many of you guys know what a stereogram is? You probably do. You probably just don't know what it's called because honestly, I didn't know what it was called until I had to Google it. Here's what a stereogram is. You guys remember these? What are are these? This is one of those paintings where when you walk by, somebody is sitting there staring at it and they're not moving. This is one of those those paintings that when you look at it, you're supposed to like let yourself go cross-eyed. And then there's an image inside here that begins to to pop out. How many of you guys remember these? You've seen these, you've done these. Okay, I'm gonna leave it up on the screen for a little bit to see if you can, to see if you can get it. Those of you online that are watching right now, if you see what's supposed to be there, type it in the comments and I'll give a free t-shirt to anybody that gets it right. 
But as I, as I thought about trials, I thought about stereograms. Now, I remember being a little kid when these kind of became popular. And I remember walking through the mall and they'd have these paintings set up like this and there would just be people sitting there staring at them. I remember walking by like, what are you looking at? Like, there's nothing there. And I remember my dad telling me like, you have to, you have to look past the picture. Like, what do, you, what do you mean look past the picture? He says, you have, to, you have to look past the picture to see what's, what's deeper, to see what's behind the picture. Mom, I think, I, think, I think dad's going crazy because there's nothing behind the picture. I remember the very first time. How many guys have ever, how many guys have been able to see those? You've, you've seen the image pop out. How many of you, you've looked at those and you've never been able to see it? I feel sorry for you. Like there really is, <laughs> let me, we're not just all playing a joke on you. There really is something there that, that pops out. And then once you see it, you can't unsee it. Like once that, once that image within an image makes itself clear, then every time you look at it, that's all you see. Even when you start to move your eyes around, all you can see is this. And so if you were wondering what was there, there was a horse in that image. Did anybody see a horse? Nobody saw a horse. There was, it was too far away. Okay, I'll, I'll text it to you later, Ms. Barb, and you can, you can try and do it on your drive back to Branson today. But as we, as we think about trials, as we think about hardships, as we think about the truth about trials, I think sometimes it feels like looking at one of those stereograms. Like, I don't know about you, but sometimes I read God's word and I'm like, I know there's supposed to be something there beneath the surface. It's just really hard for me to see it right now. Are you following me? I know God, I know you're trying to show me something, I just wish I could see past the chaos and the confusion that exists in my life right now. God, I know you're trying to say something to me, but I can't hear it because it's being drowned out by the noise of what's going on around me. This morning, as we think about trials, I think every time I, I, I see it in God's word, God is trying to show and trying to teach and trying to, to, to prepare and trying to perfect and trying to mold and trying to, to correct and trying to do all of these things through these hard times that we face. The question is, are we able to see what God's really wanting to do? Because when we see what God's wanting to do, when we see what, what's happening beneath the surface, it changes our opinion entirely. It changes our outlook and it changes our perspective. If you haven't been able to see the stereogram images, odds are every time you walk past one of them, you're like, those are so stupid. <laughs> right? Like if you can't see it, everyone you walk by, you're like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Look at these, look at these, look at these fools just standing there staring at nonsense as if there's something there. But when you finally are able to do it, when you train yourself to be able to do it, to let yourself go cross-eyed, to be able to see the image, every time you walk by one of those, what do you do? Oh, hold on, I gotta see what this is. Right? Why? Because I can see what's beneath the surface. I can see what the artist is really intending for me to see. I can see past the confusion and the chaos and something beautiful beneath begins to make itself known to me. Stop everything. I have to see what's going on here. And that's the way trials are in our lives. If you don't understand what God's doing beneath the surface, then when you face one, it's like, this is stupid. This is dumb. Like, God, just get me out of here now that glorious hope that I've been looking forward to, like you can, you can come at any second. But when you understand the beauty of what God's doing beneath the surface, it's like, hold on, hold on. God's trying to perfect me in this moment. Hold on, God's trying to show me something through this. Hold on, God's, God's trying to draw me closer. So, so stop everything else. Let me focus. God, what are you trying to show me here and now? As we walk through hard times, there's two perspectives that we can have. We can try and get as fa away as fast as we possibly can, or we can slow down and say, God, help me to see what you're really doing. See, as we, we, we look at the scripture, Peter is writing to the church. 
He's writing to the believers spread throughout these different provinces of, of the Roman Empire, and he's, he's writing to them about the trials that they're going to face. And as he writes to them, there's, there's four different things that I see in the scripture that I want to, to share with you today. The first one is this. When we go through hard times, when we go through trials, we have to understand that God is with us. If you're taking notes today, right, God is with me. If you're not taking notes today, right, God is with me. No matter what you're doing, you should be taking notes. God is, God is with me. God is with me. God is with you. No matter what we go through, God is with us. The, the Bible tells us, Peter writes, and he, he tells them that through your faith, God is protecting you by his power, not your power, his power. God is protecting you. God is watching over you. No matter what you're going through, the trials are going to come. God is with you. Notice that he tells them before, before he mentions the trials, he talks about how God's there. He doesn't say, hey, listen, you're going to go through hard times, but don't worry, God is there. No, he says, listen, you need to understand this first and foremost. God is always protecting you by his power, even when you go through hard times. He didn't start with the hard times. He started with God's protection. He didn't, he didn't start with the trials. He started with God is with you. Why? Because it's easy for us to forget what we knew to be true on the mountaintop in the valley. We go through dark times and we forget all about it. Peter's saying, listen, I want you to, to hold on to this truth. I want you to know that no matter what happens, God is protecting you, whether you're up high or you're down low, whether, whether you're in a mountaintop experience or you're walking through a valley, God is with you. Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 28, one of the last things that Jesus said is this, be sure of this, be sure of if there's only one thing that they, I want you to, if there's only one thing that I want you to be sure of, be sure of this. I am with you always. I'm with you always. It might seem to you that I'm leaving to go to be with the Father right now, but I want you to know that I will be with you always. And this promise to the disciples is the same promise that God made to Abraham. I will be with you. It's the same promise made to Moses. I will be with you. Same promise made to Joshua. I will be with you. Same promise made to Gideon. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The same promise made to the Israelites as they, they entered the promised land. It's the same promise made to them. It's the same promise made to you. That God is with you. How do I, how do I walk in that? Just embrace the promise. Take hold of the promise. Write down the promise. Remind yourself of the promise. Every day, wake up and say, God, thank you that you are with me today. God, no matter what I go through today, no matter what this day has in store for me today, God, I know that you are with me. I know that I'm not walking in it alone. I know I'm not going to work alone or going to school alone or going to the grocery store alone or, or whatever the case may be, but I know that I'm walking with you. You're walking before me and you're walking behind me and you're walking around me. And because of my faith, you are protecting me. Hello. It's a promise that we have. So many promises in God's word. I will provide for you. I will forgive you. I will, I, will, I will love you. There's so many promises that I'm thankful for. Do you know the most often used promise in all of scripture? I'm with you. The most, the most often used promise from God to his people is not I'll forgive you. It's not I will save you. It's not one day you'll be with me in eternity. The most often used promise, the, the one that God uses more often than anything else is that I will be with you. No matter what may come, I want you to know if there's one thing that you're sure of, be sure of this. I'll be with you always, even to the end. Doesn't matter what you go through. It doesn't matter how far you run. I will be with you. Doesn't matter how big of a hole you dig for yourself. I will be with you. There's no place that you can run to no place that you can go that is outside of his grasp and outside of his presence. Just as Jonah, he knows. Trying to run away from God. What happened? God found him. Why? Because I will be with you. The second thing that I want us to see in, in the scripture, and the second truth about trials is that trials are temporary. I know it feels like it's been going on forever. I know that in the moment that trial, that hard time, that trouble Feels like it's been going on forever, but I want you to know that it's temporary. Verse six, Peter writes that he says, be 
truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead. Thank you for that joy. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while. For a little while. Now, the problem is that we are, we are eternal beings having a limited temporary existence. Your spirit is created to live for eternity. So your spirit is an eternal being. You've been placed into a human body, which is temporary. And so the thing is, we have this eternal ex existence, but right now we're having such a temporary experience that it's hard for us to have an eternal perspective. We're so caught up and consumed with the here and now. Like it's, it's, it's happening right in front of me. It's happening right now. I understand it's happening right now, but it's not gonna happen forever. It's not gonna happen forever. COVID is not gonna be here forever. <laughs> You're not gonna have to wear a mask forever. Racial injustice is not going to exist forever. And even if we can't root it out in this life, guess what? There's a promise that one day we'll reach a place where there are no more tears and there are no more hardships and there are no more races and there's no more this or that. It's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave and free, but we're all one nation or many nations in many tongues singing praises to the one God. Even if, even, if it, even if it doesn't happen here, we have the promise that this is temporary. Why? Because this life is temporary. This life is not what I hold on to. This life is not what, 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 what matters the most to me. And Peter writes to them, he says, look, one day there's a hope and one day there's a joy. And so even now be glad. Why? Because even when I go through hard times, that's not the end of the story. There's something greater that lies ahead for me. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't work and we don't fight and we don't strive here and now. Absolutely, we do. That doesn't mean that we don't carry one, another, one another's burdens here and now. Absolutely, we do. That doesn't mean that we don't use our voices now to, to, to preach justice and equality. Absolutely, we do. But regardless of what happens here and now, there is something even greater that lies ahead. And this life is temporary. He's writing to, to the believers, these these Roman citizens, most of them probably were, and they're, they're living under the authority and under the rule of the Roman Empire. And he's writing them and saying, you're going to face trials. What, what trials? Now, at this point, Nero is, is in control. And history tells us that really he was the first Roman leader to, to really persecute the Christians. At this point in time, most likely these trials and these persecutions are, are simply regional. Like this isn't, this isn't any mandate from the government. This is, this is just the, the believers in these communities having run-ins or people disagreeing with their lifestyle, bringing it to a local judge or magistrate, bringing charges against them. And if they could convince the judge, there would be discipline handed out. He's writing to them because they're living a lifestyle that goes against Roman culture, Roman norms, Roman political system. They're, they're not only bucking the, the, the cultural norms, but they're bucking the political norms as well. Why? Because Roman citizens, it was, Rome was a polytheistic society. They would sacrifice to many different gods. And what happened is these people put their faith in Jesus and said, no, I can't do that anymore. I'm not going to sacrifice to your God. I'm not going to sacrifice to that God. There's only one God, capital G, and that's my God. That's the God. So they're not, they're not engaging in cultural practices anymore. So people start to look at them funny. There was really only one rule in Roman, in Roman society, Roman culture, and that was this, that you can't be loyal to anything above Caesar. You can't be loyal to anything above the government, above the state. You can worship any God you want to, but if that God comes above your loyalty to Rome, then we have problems. And then these people come around, they're like, it's not about Rome. It's about my God. It's not about, it's not about, it's not about an earthly kingdom. It's about his kingdom. So they're going against cultural norms. They're going against political norms. They're completely bucking the system. And people are starting to take notice and say, something's wrong with these people. We need to deal with it. There's problems that, that they're creating and we need, to, we need to handle that. What would happen 
as Christians, we're like, we're, we're facing persecution. You're not facing persecution. We have to wear masks into church. They're trying to, they're not persecuted. That's not persecution. Talk to first, first century believers and ask them about persecution. Ask them, ask them what it was like when you bucked the cultural norm. What did they do to you? They burned us at the stake. When, when you wouldn't go along with, with what was politically correct, what happened to you? We were fed to lions. Did you have to wear a mask to church too? We couldn't even go to church. And here we are in 2020, like we're being, you're not being persecuted. There will come a time. <laughs> Get ready for it. But right now we have the freedom and we have the liberty and we can, we can gather together. But what would happen if, if as the church, we started living like the church? And said, culturally, this is what's acceptable and this is what's normal. No, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. You want me to follow your political system? No, I'm not, I'm not going to do that because it's not about politics and it's not about government. It's about his kingdom. What would happen if we started putting his kingdom above an earthly kingdom? What would happen if we started living according to his word rather than the word of the world? What would, what would happen? He was writing to them and saying, look, because of the way that you're living and because of your faith and because, because of what Jesus is doing in you and through you, you're going to face trials, but know that God is with you. Also know that they're temporary. Psalm 30 verse five says, weeping may last through the night, but what happens in the morning? Joy. Joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in, no matter what you're going through, know that joy is coming. If your faith is in Jesus, if you're living for him, if he is not just your savior, but he is also the Lord of your life, know that I, 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 he sees the tears and he's with you through the tears, but there's coming a season of joy if you would just endure. So God is with us. Number two, trials are temporary. Number three, trials are an opportunity. Trials, your trial is an opportunity. Look at what he says in verse number seven. Peter writes, he says, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. You know how gold is purified? Fire, heat. They would, they would, take, they would take gold, they would put it into the fire, they would melt it, they would go beyond the melting point, and as that, that gold continued to heat up, the impurities that were within that gold would rise to the top. As those impurities rose to the top, they would scrape off that top layer, they would take it out, they would let it cool and let it sit, and then they would stick it back in the fire. And they would heat it up again until more impurities rose to the top and they would scrape it off. And, and, and what you were left with was 100% complete, pure gold. No impurities, no imperfections. All of that had been removed through what? Through the fire. Peter's writing to them. He's saying, this is what your trials are doing in your life. I know it's hot and I know it hurts and I know it's painful. I know it's not, it's not easy. I know it's not comfortable but they're not being wasted. God is doing something in you and through you. He's, he's allowing the heat to come so that he can remove these impurities from your life so that you will be pure and you will be complete. James writes, and he says it another way. James says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Yes. I'm sorry, what? Consider an opportunity for great joy, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. The NIV says, mature, lacking nothing. How many want to be perfect? Two of you. The same two people that think they're already perfect. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Been there, done that. No. Uh, but, but we want... We want this idea of maturity and, and completion, right? Like we, we want to lack nothing. Like I, I, want, I want to be a good dad. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good leader. I want to be a good pastor. I want, I want, I want to be mature. I want to, one day I'll be mature. Like you're wearing a Bigfoot shirt. You got a long ways to go. I want to be mature. I want to be complete. Like I, I want to grow. We all have that desire within us. But none of us want to go through the trials in order to get there. None of us want to go through the hard times to allow that endurance to grow within us. That endurance that brings that maturity to completion. 
See, your, your trials, the truth about your trials, your trials are an opportunity. Your trials are an opportunity. Peter says you'll be purified. James says you'll be complete. What if the challenge that you're currently facing is the very vehicle God wants to use to get you to where you want to go? Like, that's a radical thought. Like, what if the very thing that you're praying for God to take away is the answer to a previous prayer that you had prayed? Like, when, when somebody prays, and, and God help you if you've ever prayed this prayer, somebody prays for patience. Do you think God just gives them patience? Do you think God's up in heaven with, like, a little jug, and he's like, all right, more patience, there you go. That's not, that's not how it works. When you pray for patience, what does God give you? Opportunity. <laughs> Angels, Angels said teenagers. <laughs> he gives you opportunities to be patient. When, when somebody prays for courage, you think just poof, courageous. No, what does he do? He gives you opportunities to put fear in its place and allow courage to rise up within you. When you pray, God, help me to love them the way that you love them. Do you think God just creates these warm fuzzies inside of you? No. He, he gives you very real and very daily opportunities to love them the way that he loves them, to sacrifice your own wants, to submit yourself, to honor above you. He gives you opportunities to, to love them the way that he loves them. See, when we pray prayers like that, God doesn't just poof, make it happen. He gives you opportunities to walk it out on a daily basis. What's interesting to me is that the church, for as long as I can remember, has been praying for revival. Right? Like, how long have we been, how, how long have we been praying and having prayer meetings and crying out to God, God, send revival. Why, why, I think there's, I think there's a, there's something inside of us that might be kind of a selfish motive in that. Because I think for a lot of us, when we pray for revival, what we pray for revival for is that we look at the world and see the condition of the world. And it's like, God, we need revival. But revival is not to revive the world. Revival is to revive you. So that you can then go and be a change maker in the world. And so we look at the world and say, God, we need revival. And God's like, okay, I'll give you six months where you can't watch sports. You can't go to movies. You can't see your friends. All of those things that used to be so important to you are no longer important to you. Your career was your God. Let me remove that too, maybe. You used to go into, why don't you just work from home? You want revival, I'll give you six months to where really you have no other responsibilities and nothing else going on but to seek me. Let's see if you really want revival. We've been praying for revival for so long. God sends an opportunity for us to be revived and what do we do? We get bitter about it. We get upset about it. I'm not going to wear a mask. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just going to stay here. This, this, COVID's not even real. COVID's the black plague. The numbers are this. The numbers are that. Doctors say this. Doctors say that. We start arguing about all of these other things. Meanwhile, God's like, remember when you prayed for revival for the last 25 years? I gave you an opportunity. What have you done with it? We pray for unity. We pray for unity. God, does, God doesn't just poof, magically unified. He says, okay, let me give you opportunities to walk in unity. Let me give you opportunities for you to practice it. God, make us one. God, help us to be unified. Okay. Let's see. And what happens? Rather than standing on the one thing that unites us, we highlight all of the things that make us different and further the divide, not just within our culture, but within the church. Could it be that the very thing that you've been praying for, 
that during this time and this hardship and this trial that we've been facing, and for you, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's not COVID. Maybe it's, maybe it's something underneath the surface. But could it, could it be that the very thing that, that you're walking through right now is what God wants to use in your life to produce the most fruit? Could it be that that's the very answer to prayer that you prayed maybe years ago? And God's not just poof made it happen, but God instead has given you an opportunity to walk in it. See, when we have that perspective, it changes things. When we understand God is with us, it changes things. When we understand that trials are temporary, no matter how real they are, absolutely they're real, but they're not eternal. It changes things. When we when we start to look at them as an opportunity rather than an obstacle, it changes things. When, when we stop looking at them as something that can trip us up, but rather something that we can stand on, it changes things. Peter continues to, to write, and in fact, a few years later, he writes Second Peter, which is a second letter to the exact same people. The first letter, he writes to them about the trials that they're going to face. The second letter, just a couple years later, Peter's like, I thought, I thought I had my bases covered, but it sounds like not. They're going through something new. Now they're facing false teachers who, who are looking at them saying, I thought your Jesus was supposed to come back. He's not here yet. Maybe Jesus doesn't exist at all. Maybe it's not real. Maybe you've been believing in a lie. So they have all these false teachers telling them this. So Peter's like, I got to write to you again. Now from prison. Knowing that I'm about to die, he writes to them about the, the false teachers. And, and he says, listen, God's not, God's not being slow in answering his promise. God promised that he was with you. He's with you. God promised that he would come back. He would come back. It's what I told you in 1 Peter chapter 1. There's this glorious hope and this unending joy that we have to look forward to. But you have to understand God's ways are not our ways. He writes to them. He says, a thousand years is like a day to God and a day to God is like a thousand years. He's not being slow. He's being patient for your sake. He's, he's, he's writing to them. And at the end of his letter, he says, you already know these things, dear friends. So be on guard. Then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own sense of footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he writes to them two letters. The first one talking about the trials they're going to face. The second one talking about more trials that they're facing through these false teachers. He gets to the end and says, listen, I've, I've told you, you know all of these things. You already know the truth. You know what's happening. You know what's going on. Grow in your faith so that you won't be carried away, but instead grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying to them? Really, here's what Here's what Peter is saying. Peter is telling them that even if things around you don't get better, that doesn't mean that you can't get better. He's writing them and saying, you're going to face trials. And now you're facing false teachers. And I can't tell you when it's going to end, but I can tell you that it will end. But even with all of this going on, even if everything around you continues to deteriorate, even if everything around you continues to go down, even if nothing around you gets better, that doesn't mean that you can't. He says, rather, don't focus on those things. Rather, focus on growing in the Lord. Rather, focus on growing in his grace. Rather, focus on God. What are you trying to show me? It's like that stereogram. Put that picture back up there. This is our trial. We look at it, it's like, what the heck is that? Just chaos and confusion and it's a mess and disorder and everything around it. None of it makes sense. I don't understand any of this. I don't know what's happening. And God's like, no, keep looking. Don't focus on the chaos. See past the chaos. God, I, I, I can't. It's confusing. Don't focus on the confusion. Look past the confusion. What do you mean look past? All I can see is what's right in front of me. God, just, just take all of this away and let me see the horse that's there. No. I want you to see past it. Why? Because that's where I'm working. I want you to see past the confusion. Why? Because that's where I am. I want you to see past the chaos. Why? Because that's where I want to meet you at this most intimate time. God, just take it all away. I'm not going to take it away. Because you prayed that you wanted us to grow deeper. 
You prayed and you said that you wanted to trust me more. You prayed and, and you said you wanted to grow this year. You prayed and you said that you wanted to move forward in 2020. You prayed and you said you wanted revival. You prayed and you said you wanted unity. You prayed and you, wanted, you said you want because you prayed that, come see me. Look past it. See, the truth about our trials is one, God's with us. No matter what we face, no matter what we go through, he's, he's with us. It's his promise. Number two, we take comfort knowing that trials are temporary. No matter how long it might last, there is an end. Number three, we know that even in the midst of the trials, God's trying to do something within us. And finally, there's this promise that we have that even when the world around us is deteriorating, that we can still grow right in the middle of that. That even when we pray and say, God, take it all away, and God doesn't take it away, that doesn't mean that we can't grow in the process. What would happen? Because I, th I think we've been praying for months for COVID to be over. I don't know about you, but I have. God, just get rid of COVID. God, take it away. What would happen if we stopped praying, God, remove my trials, and started praying, God, help me to grow through my trials? God, get rid of this. God, make it all better. Just, uh, instead of asking, God, what are you trying to show me in this time? What would happen? How would, how would it look different? The truth about the trials is, when you face them, you can either get bitter or you can get better. The choice is yours, though. Stand with me this morning. This morning, with every head bowed, every eye closed, for those of you that are here in person, those of you that are watching online, as Peter writes to the, to the believers, he said, it's, it's because of your faith in Jesus that God is protecting you. If you're here today and, and you've been going through a hard time, you're watching online, you've been going through a hard time. You, you don't have access to that promise because access to that promise that God is with us is found in relationship with him. If you're here and you've never, you've never prayed, you've never asked Jesus into your heart, I want to give you the opportunity to do so right now. Whether you're here in person, watching live, watching later this week, if that's you, would you just pray this prayer? Church, help us to pray today. Just pray it from your heart. Just say, Jesus, thank you so much that you gave up your life so that I can find new life in you. And today, I confess I've messed up. I've done things and said things. But your word says that if I would confess my sin, that you would forgive me and you would wash me clean. And today, I pray that you would do that. Help me to live for you every day for the rest of my life. Lead me into all truth. Help me to be a reflection of your love and your mercy and your grace in Jesus' name. Let me pray for you, Lord. I pray for those that prayed that prayer. Some of the first time, some of the hundredth time, it doesn't matter because... We know that there are angels rejoicing and celebrating their decision in heaven. And today we celebrate with them. God, the greatest decision ever to be made is to enter into relationship with you, to accept not just you as our savior, but to accept you as our Lord and the master of our lives. God, we thank you for those that have been going through hard times, going through trials, going through troubles. Lord, we, we know that they're real and we know that they're painful and we know that they're difficult, but the promises that we find in your word are that you are with us, that the trials are temporary, that the trials are opportunities. And at the end of it all, God, we don't want to be bitter because of them, but God, we want to be better in spite of them and through them. Lord, help us to grow in you during this time and during this season. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. Those of you that